Since the Europeans had discovered the Americas in the 1490s, they had been exploring, conquering, and colonizing the Newfound Continent for the next few centuries. By the 18th century, North America had been colonized by Britain, France, and Spain. In 1754, a war began between France and Britain over disputed territories in North America. It spilled over into a colonial war across the world and ultimately led to the British forces defeating the French who had been helped by several Native American tribes. Great Britain had won the war but was left heavily in debt. At this time, many generations had been living in America. This was their home. Britain decided to tax the American colonists for the first time, but they refused to pay tax as they didn't have representation in the British Parliament by their rights as Englishmen. The colonists refused representation too in Britain, as being on the opposite side of the Atlantic made it a little impractical. American colonists began to boycott British goods and angry mobs against the British grew. The British Parliament repealed the Stamp Act but maintained it should govern over its colonies in America. The British decided to increase taxes to be paid on customs duty for imported British goods such as tea, paper, paint, lead and glass, which the Americans were reliant on. This angered more and more colonists. 4,000 British troops were sent to Massachusetts to try and threaten the people of Boston. They simply organised more boycotts but it was difficult because the highly taxed goods were so widely used. Tensions ran high in March 1770 as five colonists were killed by British soldiers during a heated incident. Word of the Boston Massacre was spread around the 13 British colonies and outrage ensued. In 1773, Britain tried to import and sell untaxed tea for the East India Company. Because Britain was trying to monopolise the tea, the Americans held the ships in Boston and didn't allow them to unload. On December 6th, a group known as the Sons of Liberty, disguised as Native Americans, boarded the ships and dumped the tea into the sea in what became known as the Boston Tea Party. In 1774, Britain punished Massachusetts with a series of acts to control the colony and place its own royal governor to take charge. But the people set up their own provincial congress. Britain was in control of Boston, but the Americans had control of the countryside as they began organising and training militias. American patriot leaders from 12 of the 13 colonies came together and convened the first Continental Congress in Philadelphia. They petitioned the king, wanting rid of the taxes and the royal governors, claiming that British Parliament had no place in internal American affairs, but they were happy to agree to the trade regulations. The British response, however, was more and more regulations, restrictions and an increased army presence. In February 1775, Massachusetts was declared to be in a state of rebellion by the British Parliament. By April, the British commander, Lieutenant General Thomas Gage, was ordered to disarm the rebels and arrest their leaders. Paul Revere and other writers rode through the night ahead of the British forces to warn the leaders in Lexington and Concord. By the time the British reached Lexington, militia were waiting for them. The first shots were fired and the militiamen fell back to Concord. The British followed them to be met by 500 militiamen. The overwhelmed British forces fell back in retreat and the war had begun. The militia chased them back to Boston and besieged the city. The Second Continental Congress of all three colonies came together to organise the war effort. The militias were to be reorganised into the Continental Army, with Congressman George Washington appointed as their general. The thirteen colonies organised revolutionary governments and began to expel the royal governors, taking control for themselves. British reinforcements led by General William Howe landed across from Boston and captured the Charlestown Peninsula in the Battle of Bunker Hill, but at a high cost of life, but they were unable to break the siege. The King of England issued a proclamation of rebellion urging the British forces to quell the Patriots. They began recruiting from Britain and Ireland and even hired Hessian mercenaries from the Holy Roman Empire. General Washington arrived at the siege of Boston the following month to take charge. Despite a shortage of munitions and gunpowder, the siege lasted through the autumn and winter, the British failing to press any advantage. The Continental Army also pressed into British-controlled Quebec to try and get the French-speaking Canadians on their side, but the British forces ultimately pushed them back. By March 1776, General Washington had gathered cannons and placed them on the hills overlooking Boston. The British chose to evacuate and head for Halifax in Nova Scotia. Knowing it would make a great naval base for the British, General Washington moved his forces down to New York City to defend it. General Howe's British forces landed close by on Staten Island in June. Meanwhile, the Congress were formally establishing a document explaining their position. Congressman Thomas Jefferson first drafted what became the Declaration of Independence, and it was ratified on the 4th of July, 1776. It declared that the 13 colonies were to be recognised as no longer part of the British Empire. They were to become known as a new nation, the United States of America. By August, General Howe's forces were ready to attack. Washington divided his troops between Manhattan and Long Island, but the British forces managed to flank them. The American forces forces were ultimately driven out of New York in defeat. The British forces saw American prisoners as traitors and not prisoners of war, and thus treated them as such. They kept them in prison ships in New York, and more Americans died of neglect and disease in these ships than in the rest of the war. Washington's forces escaped through New Jersey, across the Delaware River to Pennsylvania. Howe chose not to follow them, even though American forces were dwindling into the winter. Congress fled Philadelphia in despair with the British forces moving closer. Howe spread his forces thin throughout New Jersey, and General Washington decided to attack before the end of the year. He stealthily crossed the River Delaware at night, at Christmas, and 
surprised 1,000 Hessian mercenaries at Trenton. After a few more American victories, General Howe conceded most of New Jersey to General Washington, despite his greater numbers. Washington took it easy for the rest of the winter, while militia continued to attack small British forces. Throughout 1777, a British force under General Burgoyne pushed down from Quebec to try to cut off New England from the other colonies. It was a tough campaign, but was ultimately stopped at Saratoga, New York, by American forces under Horatio Gates and Benedict Arnold. Burgoyne hoped for help from Howe, but he'd sailed his forces south to take Philadelphia. Burgoyne surrendered. Howe outmaneuvered Washington and captured Philadelphia. Washington spent that winter in Valley Forge, where his force lost many men through cold and disease. Howe had sent his resignation and chose not to attack. During 1777 also, Congress officially adopted their new flag. To stop the British from growing more powerful, France officially declared their allegiance with the Americans and their struggle for independence in 1778. The British offered that the colonies could go back to the way they were, pre-tax, pre-war, allegiance to the crown. They were rejected. On the sea, as usual, Britain had the superior fleet, while the Americans relied on privateering to grow their non-existent fleet. Sir Henry Clinton took over from Howe and moved his forces back up to New York as the French Navy approached. The British had armed many Native American tribes and loyalists to fight against the colonists, so George Washington ordered the Sullivan Expedition to burn down Iroquois and loyalist crops and villages. In 1779, Spain officially entered the war on the side of the Americans. French and Spanish threats elsewhere in the world, such as the West Indies, were forcing the British to remove soldiers from North America. The war in the North ultimately slowed to a stalemate. The British then looked south. Clinton left New York to hopefully get a stronger foothold in the south and more support from loyalists. The winter of 1779 was even worse for the northern continental armies. The American armies were falling apart as conditions were terrible and money was worthless. Mutinies broke out in 1780, but militias were able to hold back any British troops trying to press an advantage. By May 1780, Clinton had captured Charleston, South Carolina, and most of the Southern Continental Army along with it. He returned to New York, leaving Lord Cornwallis in charge of the Southern British Army. Up north, the French landed some troops in Rhode Island, but the British Navy stopped any further French landing. Benedict Arnold had been growing disenchanted by the war and defected to the British. Horatio Gates took charge of the remaining American forces in the South, but was defeated at the Battle of Camden, allowing Georgia and South Carolina to fall back under British control. In 1781, Cornwallis continued to push through North Carolina, but his forces were worn down by battles with newly appointed General Nathaniel Green. Cornwallis retreated his forces to Wilmington, North Carolina, leaving Georgia and South Carolina. By the end of September 1781, the British only controlled Savannah and Charleston in the South. Cornwallis continued his force north into Virginia, where he ultimately set up a base in Yorktown, on a peninsula. The French fleet moved in and fought off the British ships there, cutting off Cornwallis by sea. The combined American and French forces under General Washington and the Comte de Rochambeau moved in and surrounded Cornwallis, who ultimately surrendered his army on October 9, 1781. British reinforcements were sent out from New York that same day, but it was too late. News reached Britain the following month, and the king wanted to continue the war. Fighting against France, Spain and the Dutch Republic was still happening around the world. The Tory Prime Minister Lord North resigned, and power went to the Liberal Whig Party, who recognised American independence and ended the war. The Peace Treaty of Paris was agreed in 1783, and Britain signed over the land to the United States of America. This included Native American land west of the Appalachian Mountains, unknownst to the Native Americans themselves. There would be long and fierce fighting to come over this land. France practically bankrupted itself paying for the war, leading to its own revolution in 1789. The United States would organize itself in the coming decades. They drafted their constitution in 1787 and ratified it in 1788. In 1789, George Washington was unanimously elected the first president of the United States of America. The next year, he chose an area along the Potomac River, roughly halfway down the 13 colonies, to be the new nation's capital, Washington, D.C. The United States of America would grow in many ways to become one of, if not the most powerful country in the world. But it had a long and bumpy road ahead of it both literally and metaphorically. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. A huge thank you to everyone who has supported me through Patreon so far. Everyone's generosity and enthusiasm is hugely appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe and find me on Facebook and Twitter. Let me know what you want to see next.